Good morning, and indeed it is a very warm welcome to Bandside Worship today. My name is Doreen Draffin, and I'm standing in for the Reverend Gray, who is on leave at present. The Reverend John Davy will preach next Sunday and is in call for pastoral emergencies. But please contact David Dodds, our clerk of session, for first contact. I bid a welcome to all those who are watching online and for those who will be tuning in during the week. The theme of our service today is The Greatest Book. And you'll see on your order of service that the call of worship tells us what scripture is all about. So the words will be on the screen and I invite you to say the words with me. I think they're coming up now. So it's taken from 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. And we say these words together. All scripture is inspired by God and is useful to teach us what is true and to make us realize what is wrong in our lives. It corrects us when we are wrong and teaches us to do what is right. God uses it to prepare and equip his people in every good work. And our opening praise again emphasizes how God communicates us. And we, we sing together uh, praise number 268, God has spoken by his prophets, spoken his unchanging word. Let us worship God. We quieten our hearts now as we come to God in prayers of adoration, confession, concluding with the Lord's Prayer, which we'll say together. Let us pray. Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
we still our restless hearts to be still in your holy presence. Your word amazes us as we read of you bending down your ear to hear our prayers, welcoming us to come as we are, accepted and loved. Sometimes we are so busy, always busy, putting our own interests first. The sin, we sin in thought, word, and actions, and we need forgiveness. Thank you for Jesus, who is the way to God by the cross and our example for living. Empower us by your Holy Spirit to live victoriously every day and everywhere. We pray the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. And now we're going to have our Bible reading by Christine Nesbitt, and it's Psalm 119, and I'm going to introduce it first as Christine comes. It's lovely to know the Bible, but it's even better to get to know it every day. And when I became a Christian umpteen years ago, centuries ago, uh, the lady who counseled me and uh, guided me to read Scripture Union notes. And I have the little book. You can see the date on it if you want to. But I have treasured reading notes ever from that day. And it has helped me to try to get to know God's Word. And this is how it describes this 100, 119. At the heart of our Bible is Psalm 119, whose 176 verses are in praise of God's gift of his word. The theme unfolds systematically and with grace. And you'll notice that it's in 22 sections of eight verses. And the verses that we're going to hear now talks about God's word and how God is a light. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light for my path. I have taken an oath and confirmed it, that I will follow your righteous laws. I have suffered much. Renew my life, O Lord, according to your word. Accept, O Lord, the willing praise of my mouth and teach me your laws. Though I constantly take my life in my hands, I will not forget your law. The wicked have set a snare for me, but I have not strayed from your precepts. Your statutes are my heritage forever. They are the joy of my heart. My heart is set on keeping your decrees to the very end. May God add his blessing to this reading. Amen. I invite the boys and girls now to come to the front and even the babies, because we know in Scripture that I want you to come up for, with this forward this morning. And I did ask you to bring your favorite book. So if you remembered, and mothers and babies are welcome too, so come on up. I think this is Arthur, I see. Yes. And who else? Great. I don't know all your names yet, but oh, these lovely books. My goodness. Great. Here's Pearl coming, is she? Great, excellent. Now, we better see what these books are. Can you t tell me what this one's called? Twits. Pardon? The Twits. The Twits. Oh, my goodness. I don't know this book, but I'm going to show it. I'm sure as many boys and girls know this book. Do you like it? Good. And what's yours called? The Magic Far, far Away Tree. Oh, isn't that lovely? And you're smiling. What's your books, Arthur? Oh, the baddies. Oh, my. Are there any baddies here this morning? 
Oh, no, I've, uh, yes, be honest, be honest, congregation. I see Sandra waving her hand. Yes, I'm giving it back. Is it exciting? Love, and what's your book called? The Golden Book Favourite. The Golden Book Favourite, and I see a mermaid in it. Oh, she's beautiful. Oh, and I see lots of other things in it too. Do you love it? Yes, yes. and what's yours called? Oh, the Chelsea football team. I don't know whether I should hold this up or not because my team, Manchester United, but I'll have to hold it up. You hold it up. You hold it up. What's your name? Jake. Jake. Jake has it. Oh, for all the Chelsea fans listening all over the world. Did they win this week? No. No. <laughs> Maybe next week. Isn't that lovely? And what do you like about your books? What do you like about them? Do you enjoy getting to the end and see what's happening? Yes, there's one book that I have here and uh, I've seen it on the television and I don't know if you've got to the stage of reading it. It's actually for all ages and it's called The Boy, The Mole, The Fox and The Horse. Has anyone read that in this group? Did you enjoy it? Yes, there's beautiful truths in this book. It's very good for all ages. We really see life from a different perspective. And I would uh, encourage you to look at this book or to look at it in whatever way you want to, on your tablet or whatever, and you will enjoy it. I think we're going to be looking at it in Trekkers, is that correct? So you're going to be continuing on. Our theme today is books, but really what I want to tell you about, oh, I didn't tell you what my favorite book was, and I don't know of anyone else in the congregation, but mine's the amazing world of the coloring book. And I can go all over the world. Don't look at my drawings. But it's just wonderful. It's supposed to be relaxing. But when I'm coloring in, I'm not relaxed. I'm trying to get all the pages done and all the beautiful countries colored in. They're not really very wonderful to look at. But I can look at places all over the world and imagine that I'm there. So that's one of my favorite books. But boys and girls, today is Sunday, and we're thinking, I have to bring my table over here, we're thinking of the most precious book, the most book that's sold worldwide, and it's what? It's this book, the Bible. And in the book has wonderful pictures, and there's pictures of creation, and I'm sure you saw this in your Sunday school days, and then we see a book, another picture here, and who's this? David and Goliath. And David slew the very bad. He might be in your book, The Baddies, Goliath. And you see, we start off with pictures, and I used to love them. And still, when I'm thinking of preparing a talk, I will look up the pictures. There's Jesus feeding the 5,000, and the boys and girls are there too. So it's wonderful. You can get Bibles. There's my first message. And it's a translation of the Bible that makes it very simple to read. And here we see young Samuel. And sometimes we forget, only think that God talks about older people. But he called Samuel when he was a small boy. And he gave him a wonderful purpose and meaning in life. And there's all different sizes of Bibles. If you, years ago, if you were going maybe to a restricted country and nobody wanted to know what your book was, this would be your Bible. And then sometimes in the bus I read this little book. I have it in my handbag and it tells me about all the books in the Bible. And then there's the Gideon's book. I don't know whether they're still in every hotel, but if you go to a hotel, there will be a Bible there. So it's not wonderful, all the books that you can read. And um, we're going to be, and the, the wonderful thing that the Bible tells us is that Jesus loves us. And sometimes we think, nobody loves me. Do you ever feel like that? No, not the boys and girls here. But I know in life, sometimes I felt nobody cared for me. When I did things wrong, or I was disappointed, or I wanted to go my own way, and my mother said, no, there's another way. 
And, uh, but whenever we're going to sing this song now, Jesus Loves Me, and I want you to stay at the front, and I want you to help us too, Mommy. And when it comes to Jesus Loves Me, yes, He loves me, we're going to put our thumbs up. And Jesus loves Jesus, that's Jesus, and He loves me. So we're going to do those actions. They're very simple actions. And we're all going to join in now and sing the children's praise. And it's number 270. It's written really 100 years ago by a lovely lady called Anne. And, but mostly in life, sometimes we forget the reality of these words. So we're all going to stand now and we're all going to join in and sing Jesus loves me. And thank you for bringing your books. Let us worship God in Jesus loves me. entered in this morning. Now it's turned for you to go to your lovely time together. And we'll just have some music as the children go out, David, and they'll all go out. You can take your books with you, and we'll see you again next Sunday, same time, same place. of intercession for world, community, and church by Jeremy Kyle. Heavenly Father, we take this time to offer up prayers for our world, our community, and for our church. We pray for a world rent and torn with war, suffering and violence. We pray that you will provide for a peace and an end to the suffering that can only be found in you. We pray for those who continue to suffer, and we remember all the victims in places including Yemen, Lebanon, Syria, and Ukraine. We pray for your physical and mental healing to all those affected 
and may they know your comfort and strengthen their recovery. We also pray for a planet that is suffering from the consequences of human mismanagement. Nations burning, lands suffering prolonged drought, or those disappearing underwater from rising sea levels or unprecedented rainfall. Heavenly Father, we pray that you will work your influence amongst world leaders and politicians in the remaining short time left to bring about necessary change to avert the impending consequences of global warming. We also pray for our community and particularly those who struggle with loneliness and isolation or the effects of the cost of living crisis. We also remember those who are bereaved and trying to cope with loss. We also pray for those with health issues and facing an uncertain future. We give thanks to all those who care and cure, whether it's a care team at home or nursing and medical staff in surgeries and hospitals. We ask that you will strengthen and support them during what seems to be a never relenting crisis. We also pray for our church in the dark ages we now find ourselves living. Father, we ask that you will galvanize our endeavors to ever become bearers of light and truth in a darkening and deceptive world. We thank you for all those in leadership across the many groups and organizations here at Banside who make such a difference to so many. We ask all these things in your name and for your kingdom here on earth. Amen. Thank you, Jeremy. And now we come to prepare ourselves to hear God's word and we sing the wonderful hymn 273, Speak, Lord, in the stillness. Speak your word to me. Let us worship God. We pray now that God will speak to each heart. We thank you, God, that your word is precious. We thank you that your word will meet the deepest need. But give us ears, Father, empowered and inspired by you to apply your word to our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. As I shared with the children and young people earlier, I hold in my hand the most powerful message ever written. Unfortunately, it's not the unique Geneva Bible that sold for £20,000 this week. 
If only Elizabeth Pole had bequeathed this wonderful book to Banside Presbyterian, but that was not to be. And why is it such a remarkable book? Countless lives have been changed by it. Its message is timeless, personal, and powerful, and the list could go on and on from your own experience. However, numerous authorities have tried to ban it. Some godless people have burnt it, while many Christians have died to preserve it. It still exists worldwide today because it is the very Word of God. He is the author. And as you know, the Bible is a library of books, 66 in total, written by um, approximately 40 authors over roughly 15,000 years, 1,500 years on three continents. They were inspired by the Holy Spirit to give God's message, a message for everyone. It is an eyewitness account of historical events of such magnitude that it has literally shaped the world we live in. And because of its life-changing message, it is the most published and printed book in history down through the centuries. The goal of Northern Ireland Bible Society is to reach everyone with God's Word in a language and medium they can access and afford so that each individual might experience God's purpose for their life. It's also provided in Braille, audio, sign language, and on every app that you would imagine. Go on their website and see firsthand the tremendous work that they are doing. Did you know that of the seven and a half thousand spoken languages in the world today, less than 10% of those have access to a complete Bible? Bible societies worldwide, along with individual support in prayer and finance, are aiming to rewrite this story. And what an amazing story it is. Whether you are an avid reader or not, let's explore what God's message is for you and I today. And I'm going to explain it now in one word, who God is. And you can guess from these descriptions what it is. It's unchangeable. It's unconditional. It's unique. It's free. It's not forced. And it's forever. You don't have to earn it. You're not pressurized in to reading it. And it's everlasting. And the answer, as you will have all come to now to ascertain, is love. God is love. 1 John 4 and 16 says simply those three words, God is love. This is what real love is. It's not selfish. There's no jealousy. There's no injustice. There's no keeping a record of wrongs. The list could go on and on. It can be summed up in God's character of holiness, justice, and perfection depicted from Genesis to Revelation. Search and see for yourself. One commentator describes the teachings of 1 John 4, verse 16 in this way. He entitled it, Love Explained. And he asks these three questions. Why is God a creator? And the answer is, because he created people to love. And why is he a carer? Because he cares for sinful people through his love. And why are we free to choose? Because he wants a loving response. Time does not permit to explore the many individuals who made this response. Ordinary people of all ages and cultures who discovered they could achieve extraordinary things 
because God was on their side as they acted in faith and obedience. Take Moses, for example. As a baby, he was doomed for an unfair death. He avoided the same by a miraculous rescue plan, providing with him an upbringing in Pharaoh's palace. And God used Moses at a critical juncture in the history of his people, becoming a national hero who delivered the Israelites, established in them as an independent nation. He was the first known writer of Scripture writing the first five books of the Old Testament, knowing as the Pentateuch. His life was full of drama, danger, destiny, and at the very end, disappointment. Explore his life for yourself, a man who served a holy God. Or read about Esther. This is the one book in the Bible which does not directly mention God's name. Yet the book describes the sovereign control of events by the power of God. This young woman who was open to advice and was willing to act in faith to save her nation. She combined the biggest challenge in her life with courage, backed by the support of fasting and one presumes prayer, entrusting herself to the care and protection of her God. Someone aptly said, he may be behind the scenes, but he moves every scene that is behind. Read Esther and find that out for yourself. God was there, perhaps in the shadows. We don't hear his name mentioned, but every verse, every chapter is leading to what God's plan was for the Jewish nation. And when we think of David, we see him in his youth as a shepherd boy, the giant slayer, musician and poet, and anointed by Samuel the prophet to one day become Israel's most loved and greatest king. His reign was a high point in God's plan for Israel, resulting finally in the ancestral birth of Jesus, the promised Messiah. What a privilege this young boy had and his family. He was also to be known as a man after God's own heart. What a lovely description. The many Psalms found at the center of her Bible are proof of that. Whether in times of joy or despair and even great struggle, honest feelings are expressed in these sentiments. I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and he heard my cry, Psalm 40. And Psalm 139, you have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You are familiar with all my ways. In confidence, David could proclaim who God is. The Lord is my shepherd. I have all that I need. He lets me rest leading me by peaceful streams, renewing my strength, guiding me along the right path. What uplifting, soothing, strengthening words for the busy, challenging 21st century we live in. Take time to pause. Nestle in the Good Shepherd's care and keeping. The outcome will be so worthwhile. Know him as your own personal shepherd and you will discover that he will meet every need for you. Thirdly, David, more than anything else, had an unchangeable belief in the faithful and forgiving nature of God. He lived with great zest. He sinned many times, but he was quick to confess his sins. His confessions were from the heart, and his repentance was genuine. In this, he experienced the joy of forgiveness, even when he had to suffer the consequences of his sin. Read First and Second Samuel. Read First and Second Kings, which goes over the story, and also, I think, in Chronicles. 
but we remember most of all his prayer from the heart. Create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. The cry of a broken person, the cry of someone who needed forgiveness. And David knew how to turn tragedy into triumph, a lesson that each of us need to learn in days of testing and trial. We heard that in our prayers of intercession this morning. We do live in an ever-changing, challenging, and chaotic world. There are so many books out there to help you understand the Bible. And one that I found useful is Warren Wearsby's book, and it's on the Psalms. And he has written, Meet Yourself in the Psalms. And I recommend this stimulating book. I'm going to put it in the church library, which you know books can be borrowed there, and you'll find many other books to help you too. They're free, so feel free to browse. But the best thing to do, rather than have a library of books to help you to read the Bible, is to read the Bible for yourself. I shared when I became a Christian at 15 that someone introduced me a study book, study notes, to study the Bible. And I found a Bible study group wherever I went all over the world because I want to learn more from God's Word. So I encourage you to join a Bible study group, to have daily Bible reading notes, to spend time alone yourself to hear from God, and most of all, to read our Bibles. As we briefly dip into the New Testament, time will only allow a bird's eye view of its teachings. 400 years of prophetic silence lay between the close of the Old Testament and the New. Finally, God's silence ended. As Matthew opens his gospel, uh, the Jews are now unwilling subjects of the Roman Empire. They are allowed freedom of worship and limited authority in overseeing their own affairs. But they are longing for more. They're aware of the prophecies and watch expectantly for the promised Messiah. And as you turn the page of the Gospels, which means good news, uh, giving us first-hand eyewitness accounts of Jesus' birth, his death, and his resurrection, you will get an overview of four different writers there. So you will find out different things in different places, some's to the Jews, some are writing to other people so that all will come to know about Jesus. The book of Acts was written by Luke and provides a brief history of the earliest Christian church after the victory of Christ's resurrection and the sending of the Holy Spirit to equip and to empower the church. And as you read Acts, there are high points, like the massive conversions at the day of Pentecost. About 3,000 were added to the church in one day. Isn't that amazing? 3,000. And there are low points, like squabbles between Christian leaders about what the church should do and how evidently there was a lack of God's love in that situation. But through it all, this dramatic book provides today's Christians with valuable lessons about what makes the church and how we can play our part in it. Read and explore and enjoy the book of Acts. The next 13 books are letters written by the transformed Saul of Tarsus, becoming the Apostle Paul, a preacher for Christ. He preached throughout the Roman Empire on his three different missionary journeys. He wrote letters to newly established churches, encouraging, discipling, and addressing problematic issues. Four of his letters were written from a prison cell. Thankfully, he was released for unfair charges. He suffered so much, shipwreck. He suffered loneliness. He did all this because he met Jesus. And then he only desired to preach Christ crucified, bringing hope to all. And one of his verses, which you know, and I know it's in a modern phrase, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. 
was his purpose for life. And as you explore these personal heart-to-heart messages of hope and rebuke, you will discover the numerous lives that Paul and his team touched, challenged, and changed by meeting Jesus through them. This is echoed in the concluding books of the the last five books. We read of James and Peter and Jude and John. And they were all, if you read the beginning of their short, short messages, they described themselves as a servant of Jesus Christ. And it's so lovely to read that. Revelation deals with the future unveiled. And we have covered from Genesis very briefly to Revelation. But what an incentive to read and study the most powerful message ever written, starting with the New Testament, if you haven't read the Bible before, and and journey with Jesus, journey with the first church, journey with Paul. And if you have any questions who God is and why he loves you, you'll discover this as you turn the pages. The Bible is God's gold mine. Someone once described it. Outwardly, it may look a very ordinary book, and to some it may seem uninviting. But the treasures to be found inside are really thrilling, and the more you read it, the more you see, and the more that you can communicate, as we sang in our praise earlier, speak, Lord, in the stillness as we wait on you. Let's conclude with reflecting on some of the precious gems from God's Word. And you're going to see some verses now on the screen of the um, Bible verses that we're going to uh, look at in just a moment. And the first one is when God created human beings. He made them to be like himself. And we read that in Genesis. So the verse is going to, you can say them inwardly to yourself, you can say them out loud, but as we look at these, we will find the gems that are in God's word for you. When God created human beings, he made them to be like himself. We read that in Genesis. Eat every day of my life was recorded in your book before one of them came to be. I have loved you with an everlasting love, With unfailing love, I have drawn you to myself. And God says, for I know the plans I have for you, plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a hope and a future. And Jesus says, come to me, all that you are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And then we finish with, do not be anxious about anything. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for what he has done, writes Paul in the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verse 6. So as we ponder on the truths, as we ponder on the realities, when we ponder on Jesus' love, the cross and the resurrection, we have so much to learn from this book. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your precious word. Teach me from it often. Help me to store it up in my heart, to keep me from sin, and help me to share it with others, guided by your love and leading. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And we conclude our worship with a a very familiar hymn, uh, Praise 104 in your hymn book, Guide Me, O Thy Great Jehovah. And in this hymn, we sing the words from the Old Testament. We sing about bread from heaven. We sing about the crystal fountain. So we're actually singing what's in Scripture. But when you read it, the Bible must always be read in context of the situation who God's writing to. So we stand now to worship as we say, sing this tremendous hymn.
as we dedicate our gifts and our tithes and our offerings, we pray that you would bless the work that's sometimes unseen and the work that we forget sometimes to pray for. And we pray that you would abundantly bless it. And we pray that you would take your word because you have promised that it will not return void. Help us to love it, to cherish it, to read it and to study it. And we say the grace that the Apostle Paul ends each of his letters with. And we say this together. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Amen.